Welcome to The Empowering Neurologist. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. You know, there seems to be a bit of a misunderstanding in the world of being on a ketogenic diet or keto diet uh, that it, it looks to many people that this is a diet that's just loaded with uh, animal products, meat, eggs, cheese, dairy, you name it. And the reality is you can get into a ketogenic state, be in ketosis, without uh, consuming animal products or consuming a few animal products if that's your choice. There's a new book out called Ketotarian and it's a terrific book. It's written by Dr. Will Cole and that's with whom we will speak today. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He is a functional medicine practitioner. Uh, his website is drwillcole.com. Uh, he's in Pittsburgh but he does a lot of consultations uh, through the internet. Uh, he investigates underlying factors, learns about uh, individuality in terms of patients, in terms of what might underlie their specific health issues, and then he is involved in customizing specific programs based upon that individual's need, which is certainly, I think, in contrast uh, to the standard Western medical model where, we, where the goal is to fit the patient into the model as opposed to trying to understand who that patient really is. He's involved in treating thyroid disorders and very much involved in treating inflammatory and autoimmune conditions as well as digestive disorders. And as you might expect, by paying attention to diet, his work has a huge influence on brain health and function. Uh, he was named one of the top 50 functional medicine and integrative doctors uh, in America. And as mentioned, he is the author of this new book, Ketotarian. Uh, I was delighted to endorse it. And we're going to jump in right now and say hello to Dr. Will Cole. Well, Dr. Will Cole, welcome to our program. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Very, very I'm doing great. Uh, I enjoyed your book and uh, here it is uh, for all to see. So I want to, you got a great title here, Ketotarian. What do you mean by that? Who is a Ketotarian? Ketotarian is my play on words. It's a plant-based ketogenic lifestyle uh, and it's this uh, you know amalgamation of the best of both ways of eating and I didn't see it as you know one side or the other I think really both can be symbiotic and something that you really can bring both principles of both ways of eating together to amplify one's wellness and to be clear when you say both you mean both ketogenic type of diet and being mostly vegetarian uh, I know you have a couple of uh, ideas here that are not necessarily plant-based, but nonetheless, why would a person <clears throat> want to engage both of these? I mean, uh, let's, let's first talk about uh, why would you want to be on a ketogenic diet? Yeah, and that's just something as a functional medicine practitioner that I've seen amazing uh, health benefits and the science is very exciting. I'm uh, very excited about what's coming out in the scientific literature, but what uh, what I'm most excited about as far as ketosis is concerned and nutritional ketosis being a fat burner is the anti-inflammatory benefits that it has. Most of my patients are somewhere on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum and they have these high inflammatory uh, markers on their labs and they feel it too. And beta-hydroxybutyrate, the main ketone that our liver naturally produces, as you know, is a strong anti-inflammatory. Uh, that is wonderful, but also we also know that the main uh, metabolic benefits of being a fat burner too. We lose weight, we are uh, more lean, uh, and your uh, weight loss is a natural byproduct of being in this metabolic fat burning state. So that's another benefit of ketosis. Uh, and I love the, f the impact that it has on the brain, the, the fact that beta-hydroxybutyrate can pass through the blood blood brain barrier and be clean fuel for the brain, be anti-inflammatory for the brain. And I also love the mitochondrial bio biogenesis, the fact that ketones can actually produce more mitochondria and cellular energy. So all of this stuff I love about the ketogenic diet, but what I saw, what was unintentionally going maybe a, a little bit awry on social media and more of the conventional way of eating the ketogenic diet was avoiding all plant foods because of its you know, carb content and their main goal was ketosis at all costs and anything that lowered ketosis at, at anything they would uh, want to avoid uh, and then that left them really eating anything as long as it's high fat low carb 
you know, with vats of cheese and bacon all day long. And I, in the short term, I think there's benefits to that. That's better than the standard American diet. They're avoiding carbs and sugar. But long-term wellness is really what I was thinking. Uh, was people were stuck at plateaus past that honeymoon period of going keto. Uh, where were they going to go sustainably? And the impact that could have on the gut microbiome, the impact as far as antioxidants were concerned. Uh, so those are. That's why I wanted to kind of fuse that uh, way of being ketogenic with the best of being plant-based. And by plant-based, I mean plant-centric. So adding tons of non-starchy vegetables into your life. And in Ketotarian, there are many vegan keto options for people who want to be entirely plant-based. But I give the arguments as far as the bioavailability of the omega fats and fat-soluble vitamins that to open maybe some of the people in the plant-centric world or the plant-based world to bring in some things like eggs or ghee or wild-caught fish. So there's many uh, keto vegetarian and keto pescatarian options for people as well. So I wanted to basically bring something new to the conversation. I don't think we need another ketogenic cookbook. And I wanted to kind of recalibrate the keto world and recalibrate the plant-based world too. Well, that was a you know a really in-depth opening statement, and I would say I'd like to unpack that just a little bit more because uh, you covered a couple of points I think that really need uh, a little bit of a deeper expo expo exploration. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the uh, probably the most uh, talked about benefit uh, is that well, you're switching from burning carbohydrate and uh, basically sugar uh, to burning fat. In this case, talking about the merits of burning beta-hydroxybutyrate as a ketone body, but you actually uh, weaved that in really quite nicely to the notion of reducing inflammation via amplifying beta-hydroxybutyrate availability by being on this type of diet. And I think that's a really very important point for two reasons. First, uh, we recognize that inflammation is a cornerstone of all of our most dreaded uh, long-term degenerative conditions, whether involving the brain, the heart, the physiology in general. Uh, things like uh, metabolic problems, diabetes, and even cancer. So to recognize that beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is what you produce when you're in ketosis, is more than just a cool fuel, or as some have called it, a super fuel, but is a signaling molecule. It's actually uh, stimulating uh, G-protein receptors on cell surfaces to initiate pathways that reduce inflammation, that augment uh, immune function, for example, I think is taking it uh, a bit further, and a very important a bit further, as I might add. Uh, the, the second thing that you uh, really amplify, and I think it's great that you did this finally, is um, you know people have the notion that being on a ketogenic diet is basically Atkins redux. It's basically, oh, you know, the Perlmutter grain brain, eat meat all day and eggs and butter and hope for the best. And it isn't. And um, <clears throat> how really grateful we are that you create these recipes that show people, you know, you could be basically vegetarian and be in ketosis. I mean, I know what that's like. And I think you also brought up a really important point that people shy away from fiber rich vegetables because yes, fiber is carbohydrate by definition, but recognize that when we're looking, for example, at prebiotic fiber, we're looking at fiber that is not metabolized and digested by us humans, but is in fact fueling our good bacteria, letting them make wonderful chemicals that, uh, you know, help us be healthy. So uh, this is though at its most core level really about uh, lowering blood sugar and making ketones available, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So the primary object objective here is to lower insulin, lower blood sugar, lower inflammation, and allow ketosis to come up, allow your body to have that clean fuel. It's akin to a uh, log on the fire. It is a lot more sustainable. It's more slower burning. People are off of the blood sugar roller coaster that many people are on, where they're put throwing kindling throughout the day. They're having to eat six meals, small meals a day, because it's kindling after kindling after kindling. And we know uh, that there's the dirty kindling of the standard American diet with all its carbs, but then there's so much cleaner kindling of the real food movement and all the healthy or snack foods out there, but ultimately they're broken down into carbohydrates and sugar and, uh, and, and it's biking insulin to varying degrees. It's the cleaner kindling is is better, but just because something's better than the standard American diet, it doesn't mean it's optimal for long-term wellness. So 
I it's that's really what I wanted to educate people on uh, in Ketotarian. So uh, you and I both agree this is the ticket to wellness. Uh, people watching this video have been thinking about it for a while and maybe this is what they've needed to move forward buy your book and, and do this. But what are some of the setbacks? What are some of the problems, pushbacks that you're hearing from people when they begin to adopt a ketogenic program? Depending on what the patient's up against when they start that uh, and years of being in this sugar burning, kindling on the fire metabolic state, they have to make that metabolic transition. And sometimes there can be detox type symptoms because their body, their microbiome is shifting. They're not getting all the sugar and the grains and the carbs uh, that they were depending on for fuel. And there can be some Herxheimer or sort of die off responses for some people uh, because they aren't totally being filling themselves up with this sugar all day long. Not everybody has this problem. Some people, they feel fantastic right away. But for some people, they have to make that metabolic transition to being a fat burner. So that's definitely something that I write about in Ketotarian. So people are um, they're aware of what may uh, happen uh, as they're changing the foods that they eat. But this is about sustainable wellness. And we have to do something different to see different results. And if someone doesn't like the way that they feel, they have to make those changes. Uh, so that's something that can happen as you start making that metabolic shift. And they can be in a couple of days or uh, they could be in this metabolic purgatory where they're off of all the sugar but their body's not fully fat adapted yet either. Uh, so you can, again, Ooh, this isn't a- Let me hold you there, the metabolic purgatory. Well, <laughs> take me through that. What does that mean? It doesn't sound like it's fun. Yeah, metabolic pur it's, what well, it's, it doesn't sound fun at all. But oftentimes when people are depending on every meal, having uh, varying amounts of grains and carbs, and then they don't eat that anymore, I find that some people, they don't know how to eat more food that isn't those carbs and grains and f junk foods. So they just calorically aren't eating enough food. So they're hypocaloric and they aren't fully fat adapted yet. So it's not a fun place to be at. Those people can mitigate this metabolic purgatory by eating more healthy fats and eating all the clean ketotarian foods that we talk about in the book that are very nutrient dense, filling, satiating foods. So this metabolic purgatory most of the time happens because the person maybe is in a, is in a dieting mentality of I have to I have to calorie restrict to lose weight, um, and they are maybe uh, not used to not eating sugar. But they can, again, focus on these foods until they're satiated, until they're filled, uh, to mitigate this, this metabolic transition of being a fat burner. So when people are stumbling through it and at the gates of purgatory, uh, do you have them ease into the program? Yeah. So. For every sciencey, more advanced track I put in Ketotarian, I wanted to have some keeping it simple options because as we both know, there are some people that are like, what the heck is this keto thing? And they want to jump in and go zero to 60. And sometimes that's too fast, too soon for where they're at. So if somebody is starting off on just the standard Western diet and they're not really eating clean, I suggest in Ketotarian to just start off with the food list not worry about ketosis. Just focus on the real foods that are ketotarian friendly. And then from there, I would do that for 30 days. And then from there, they can lean into ketosis. That way, they've cleaned up their gut a bit. Inflammation starts to come down. They've been focusing on these healthy fats for their body. So at that point, they've made that metabolic transition so they can gradually just go in into ketosis more effortlessly and not go zero to 60 and then feel like a failure because they try to do all things at once. So one of the uh, issues that people seem to bring up is, you know, they started going on a ketogenic diet. And they don't feel well. They feel fatigued and aren't sleeping well and have brain fog. What do you tell these individuals? I would first want to check in to see if they are in ketosis or not. And how do because you do that? So there are a few different ways. I mean, one natural sign of ketosis is, or a list of them, is having more energy, having more brain clarity, having losing weight. But if that's not happening, I would check in uh, and test for ketosis. So there's 
three ways to do that. The gold standard is testing for blood. Uh, it's similar to a glucometer for diabetics. It's a little prick, it's very painless, and it measures ketones. And that's the gold standard because it's measuring beta-hydroxybutyrate, and you know at that point that your body's actually burning it and producing it, in the, and it's showing up on the, on the ketone meter. The second way, which I am excited about the research around it and the developments that they're having in technology, is the breath meter. The, there's the brands like Ketonics and other brands out there too that measure breath acetone. Uh, and research shows that breath acetone is a good measurement of beta-hydroxybutyrate. So it's a good way to gauge if your body's producing ketones. And people like the breath meter because they don't have to prick their finger and it's a simple breathing into a tube and it can measure breath acetone. And then the third way is the urine strips, which most people probably are familiar with, uh, and that's measuring acetoacetate. That is okay to use at the beginning because it's a good gauge on, hey, is there some ketones in my urine? But long term, as you become more fat adapted, you're becoming more of a fat burner, that tends to go lower with time, and it's not a good gauge on if you're burning ketones. It's just showing that you're good at peeing out ketones. Uh, so I want to know, hey, if this person's not feeling great, if they're not getting the benefits of ketosis, I want to know if they're actually burning it. So I would probably uh, uh, tell them, hey, let's try testing blood ketones to see what's going on there because maybe they're they're not fully keto adapted yet, and they're, they're staying in this this – uh, metabolic purgatory a little bit longer than they should, and they need to push their body into ketosis. I'm still thinking about the metabolic purgatory. My gosh, I, I may have to take that one from you. Um, <laughs> when people um, are entering into ketosis early on and don't feel well, oftentimes there's a discussion uh, that they need more electrolytes of one form or another. How does that work? So when you're becoming fat adapted, one of the benefits of ketosis is you're, you're losing inflammation, you're losing intracellular fluid, you're losing edema and water weight basically. So your body's more lean and you're losing all this excess fluid that your body's holding on to. Um, but because you're lo losing that excess fluid and fat, uh, your body can lose the electrolytes in that fluid, uh, namely uh, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, these electrolytes. So you want to make sure that you're optimizing your electrolytes when you are eating ketogenic or uh, ketotarian. But in ketotarian, because we're focusing on all these nutrient-dense foods with sodium and potassium and magnesium and calcium, uh, that is mitigated because you're eating these nutrient-dense foods with electrolytes. But that said, some people, even if they're eating these clean, plant-based, ketogenic foods, they may still want to supplement uh, with uh, different electrolytes. You can use sea salt. You can do something called sole water, which is basically um, higher concentrated salt water. Uh, and you can just have a, a teaspoon, tablespoon of that throughout the day just to rehydrate your body with electrolytes. And what about constipation? That seems to be a fairly common complaint early on. Yes. And that that's also due to the loss of water and staying hydrated is super important for anybody. But especially when you're becoming a fat burner and you're making that metabolic transition, stay well hydrated. Again, eating all the fiber that is in ketotarian at least, uh, that typically isn't a problem because they're eating such good uh, fibrous foods that helps for healthy gut function. I do see that problem more with the conventional ketogenic diet where they're having lots of dairy and meat and not enough fiber. Uh, that constipation is more problematic for the conventional keto diet. I, I think that's a very, very important point, you know, because constipation uh, across the spectrum of individuals going on a ketogenic diet uh, is, is pretty common. And I think you hit the nail on the head that, you know, again, people think I'm going to be eating meat. Uh, and dairy and eggs all day and it's going to be good for me. Well, if you're constipated, it's telling you a couple things. A, your, your digestive system isn't working appropriately and B, you're probably not catering to your microbiome appropriately uh, for the reasons you just stated, that you're not getting those fiber-rich uh, vegetables, so you're not giving your microbiome the nutrients that it needs and providing the bulk in your gut uh, to allow a, appropriate uh, digestion, assimilation, et cetera. So it's a common problem, I think. And that's, again, you know, one of the very strong points of finally seeing your book, which is talking about eating more vegetables and, bottom line, eating food and enjoying food. I think a lot of people think, well, if fasting is important on the ketogenic diet, then it uh, means I'm not going to be eating very much. And 
you know, I love to eat. I love it. You know, I look forward to it every single day. And, and that's what's great about what you've written is your recipes are, they're over the top and you can enjoy food. You're not um, you know, standing at the gates of metabolic purgatory anymore. You're enjoying life. Uh, so that said, tell us about some of your favorite recipes. Yeah, so in Ketotarian, there's over 80 different vegan keto, vegetarian keto, and pescatarian, or what I call in the book, vegetarian, another play on words, but these wild, wild caught fish with lots of vegetables as well, uh, recipe, keto recipes. Um, so there are a lot that I love. Um, some that I love for breakfast, which I, I love it just because a lot of people don't think you can have them when you're eating a keto diet are smoothies. Uh, I don't think, I love fasting in the morning. I, I, I'm, I eat when I'm hungry and I'm typically not hungry in the morning. Uh, so I typically would just have some Earl Grey tea uh, in the morning and eat at lunch. But many people enjoy breakfast. It's the art of breakfast. And I want people to enjoy it, as you said. I don't think that wellness should be uh, you know, arduous and this sort of gritting your teeth just to get through the day. And if you enjoy breakfast, you can eat breakfast. Uh, so there's a lot of keto smoothies uh, in the book that are all real food. And people like the simplicity of it. They're about to get out and uh, go to work in the morning. They don't want to spend a lot of time in the kitchen. They can just throw some great healthy fats in like uh, coconut oil, almond milk, coconut milk, and good green leafy vegetables, some fruit. They can add some MCT oil on if they want and blend it right up. So there's a many, there's a whole recipe section in Ketotarian uh, devoted to smoothies and breakfast ideas. Uh, for lunch, I love this zoodle bowl, this pesto zoodle bowl uh, that is made with zucchini noodles, uh, zoodles, and with good pesto sauce, with avocado dressing, it's really delicious. And then for dinner, uh, I like two things. There's an albacore tuna uh, salad with grapefruit and avocados, and I also like the Eggo Cotta, which is a version of that is actually the cover of Ketotarian. It's an egg in an avocado. I, I actually, book. I just happened to open the book to that. I mean, it is on the cover, but I was gonna just show uh, yeah. our, our uh, viewers some of the yeah. beautiful photographs. I love picture books, so yeah. look at that. Isn't that just great? Uh, yeah. Ever since Thank Cat you. in the Hat, I've been dialed into picture books, but uh, <laughs> as well as the text. So one question we get uh, commonly is, where does alcohol fit into the picture in terms of trying to remain in ketosis? Yeah. So in Ketotarian, uh, I advocate in the book to do this for eight weeks. Do this plant-centric keto thing for eight weeks to give your body the time to make that metabolic transition to being a fat burner, get the anti-inflammatory benefits, get the mitochondrial brain benefits of ketosis. And then from there, they can start personalizing it a little bit. So that involves uh, many different things to make it a lifestyle and not a, a diet. Um, but one of that is bringing alcohol in. So alcohol in. So for the eight weeks, there's I advise not to have alcohol. Not that I'm, I think that it can be fine in a healthy ketotarian lifestyle. But I wanted to have it as clean as possible. Give the liver a break there. But actually, uh, if you look at the mechanisms and some studies done on that, and I've seen this in patients too, uh, dry alcohol, specifically wine. Uh, can actually increase ketosis for some people. And I saw a study actually, it actually impacts uh, growth hormone levels. And uh, people, when people measure their ketones, they'll actually see the ketones come up. So if they have a glass of wine at dinner, they may see actually higher ketones in the morning uh, compared to when they don't have that glass of wine at dinner. Uh, so I think clean wine uh, can be a great part of a healthy ketotarian lifestyle uh, for many people. And what about caffeine? Caffeine, uh, I think, could be great too. So the mechanism there is at the beginning, cortisol can come up. If someone's not used to drinking coffee or uh, tea, their cortisol can go up higher. It can impact their blood sugar a little bit, and they may see that impacting uh, ketosis in the short term. But the studies that I've seen is that with time, there's this adaptation that goes on and you don't see the high spike in cortisol long term uh, and I actually think it's going to be a great uh, way to increase lipolysis to increase the meta metabolic uh, rate uh, and be a healthy part of one's ketotarian lifestyle obviously 
there's a lot of pesticides and spraying that can go on with, with when it comes to coffee. So from a wellness standpoint, I'd recommend organic coffee, organic tea. But I think both of those can be a great food, a uh, great drink to focus on. Uh, I think positive re- uh, remarks about coffee will always gain you friends. Yeah. I have learned. Uh, yes. Me included. So listen, <laughs> thank you for joining us today. This is great information. The book is awesome and we've needed your book for a long time. So I was happy to uh, endorse it. I think you're doing a, a really great job. Thank you so much. And I just, can I say, like, just thank you so much for your support and kindness to me over the years and writing the blurb on the front cover of Keto Terry and it really meant the world to me. Well, I appreciate that. And um, I did it from the heart because you, you really put out some really vital information for a lot of people. So thanks. Thanks so much. Interesting information, isn't it? Uh, we're hearing more and more about the powerfully health related benefits of getting on a diet that is powering your body with fat as opposed to carbs. And beyond that, not just from a fuel perspective, but from a signaling perspective, where one of the ketones produced on a diet like ketotarian is called beta-hydroxybutyrate and how beta-hydroxybutyrate actually acts not just as an ideal fuel cell for our cells and our brain cells in particular, but also acts as a signaling molecule to temper down things like inflammation. So again, uh, here is Dr. Will Cole's exciting new book, Ketotarian. Uh, I think it's going to do really well. Uh, It's very well written. Recipes are top notch. So I hope you'll take a look at that. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Bye for now.